Good evening, and welcome to Sunday Evening Vespers. It is wonderful to be with you all this week, and I want to thank Bobby Holder for playing the piano this evening, and I want to thank the Reverend Stephanie Allen from Church of the Nativity, Episcopal Church, who is sharing our message this evening. So thank you to both of them. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we enjoy the prelude. Please join me in the call to worship, which is from Psalm 42 and found in the bulletin. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Put your hope in God. We will praise him again, our Savior and our God. Our first hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, found on page 56 in the hymnal.
Let us pray. God, you are the source of all light. By your word, you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened to your word. Amen. The scripture reading this evening comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you do? What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told him, them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is so good to be back here with you all. I think the last time I was here, we weren't singing. So it's so nice to sing. Oh, it feels so good. It feels so good. And I just want to say thank you to Lori and to Juliana for keep, they keep inviting me back, which makes me feel so good, so good. And they're just awesome. You all know how awesome they are, but just... Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to see you all. And what a great piece of scripture tonight. I wish that it was November and it was a little chilly outside and we had a fire pit and we were all gathered around the fire pit because this is a this is a spooky story to tell outside right like this needs a storyteller to give this story i mean the scripture could make it so dry the the the, the man who was possessed by demons like we're so serious about this but this is a crazy story right so for one thing i just i just love this the first thing is that it's i mean it feels very not safe for church right he's naked no clothes. He's running around without clothes on, right? I mean, it just if we stop to think about it, and also the fact that the scripture says he has no home. 
this poor man has no place to go. So, no clothes. You can imagine he's not taking care of, shall we say, personal hygiene. So imagine, you know, like if I don't take care of my hair, it goes, especially in the North Carolina humidity, I don't know, maybe you some of this, it's mad, it's probably matted and dirty, he's dirty. So imagine this man who, it sounds like he's pretty out of control too. Like he can't, he can't stop his body. Like he sounds like everything, kind of like me. Everything he does is big, right? There's no holding it in and being quiet, which is unlike some of the other folks that Jesus healed who were hiding in a sense. But this guy is all out there. Now, we also know what the story tells us, and if we were around a campfire, we could really go into detail. This this wild man with matted hair, covered in dirt, naked, no one to look out for him, no one who was attending to him, essentially. Like, he's violent. He's erratic. You don't know where he's going to go next. And it sounds like people are afraid of him. Right? So if someone sees him out there running around in the wilderness, you cross the street, right? And and you put your kids or your loved ones on the other side because you don't you don't know what this guy is gonna do. So they're they're afraid of him. It's also interesting, it's very clear that this story takes place where Jesus is is outside of town, right? He's out in the country, right? He's he's not in the city proper. And it does say again and again how these demons would drive this man out, away from community, away from care, away from connection. So not only is his behavior, I mean, just the way he's acting is isolating him. And he's being pushed out even farther. But then it says that, and it sounds like he has some wherewithal to realize that this awful thing is happening to him. He doesn't like being out of control. That he, he is in pain. He is suffering, not only from the isolation, but when he's brought into community again, what, the only way it can happen is he must be tied down. He must be shackled. So think for a minute if you've ever felt in polite company (laughs) and there's something you really want to (laughs) say, but you hear your mother's voice saying, "Uh, uh, uh." (laughs) ah, ah, that's not nice, right? This is an entirely different kind of shackle, but the same idea. To keep the community safe, this guy's got to be held down, but the power of this otherworldly demons is so strong that he can even break that. No wonder the people are terrified, and no wonder this man is suffering, and so no wonder that is what Jesus is drawn to. Jesus isn't afraid. Jesus doesn't shy away. Jesus doesn't say to his disciples, okay, boys, hold him down while I talk to him. Jesus is God. So this tells us very clearly, it's reminding us, the readers, as we're, or the listeners, as we're sitting around our campfire, that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, of not only these things that we see, but all the things that are unseen as well that this is not just an ordinary man who's teaching us good things about how to be nice to one another, that there is a cosmic battle between good and evil that is happening here, and Jesus is the one that God sends to rule over all powers and to end this battle once and for all. And another thing that really strikes me about this, that I would really act out if we were around that campfire, is the fact that Jesus doesn't slay the dragon, so to speak. Jesus, encountering the man and seeing that, the, that these demons 
have hold of the man at that moment. He's not in his right mind. He is not himself. He speaks directly to this spirit, and the spirit recognizes Jesus. The spirit knows exactly who Jesus is, too. Jesus speaks to that spirit with the same amount of compassion that he speaks to anybody else who needs healing. It's so totally opposite of our instinct that if something is violent and destructive, that we also must be violent in return. If somebody hits you, you hit them harder. No, Jesus says, actually, you turn the other cheek. You go up to that demon who has caused you so much suffering, and you say, what is your name? It's very rare that Jesus asks a name. We don't hear the man's actual name, but we get the name of this spirit. And what's interesting, too, is this exchange between Jesus and this spirit is that it does seem that not only is there compassion there, but the spirit itself is also somehow longing for connection, for community. What does it ask for? Don't send me back into the abyss. Don't send me into nothingness. Is there anything worse, right? A feeling where things are so dark and so black and there's nothing. There's no hope. There's no future. There's no past. There's just nothing. There's no connection. It's complete and total isolation. It's why one of the worst things that we do to people who are in prison is solitary confinement. That is the abyss. And Jesus says, okay. Now, now this is where the story gets crazy again. And so, you know, we got to, we're, we're around our campfire, we're listening, we're riveted, like, what's going to happen next? Pigs show up, right? <laughs> and this is when I would have our teenagers come in, like I'd ask the youth groups help with this story, and they'd come in wearing pig snouts, and they'd kind of run around and run all over us and around us and make a lot of noise and kick up a lot of dirt, right? So I don't understand this business about the pigs. Like, one thing it does tell us is that Jesus is here in this town of Gentiles, right? That there are pigs here being raised, so, so we're clearly not in Jewish territory here. And, and this is actually an important detail because it is telling us that Jesus' message of healing is for everyone, that the message is not just for the select group of the chosen people of Israel, that this just got a lot bigger, too. So it is every person on this planet, as well as all things in the created world. It is the other spirits as well. It is all things heavenly. It is all things earthly, in case you, we didn't get that before, right? So these pigs come in. Jesus sends them into the pigs, which I just, again, too, like, what? <laughs> why would we make that look, right? And they go and they jump off a cliff, right? Like, this story isn't dramatic enough. The pigs run off a cliff. And then I, I, you know, I don't know, and I guess this is just one of those things that we can make up our own, like, when the pigs die, did the demons die? And were they then, like, reunited with God? I don't know. It doesn't go there. So we'll just make up our own story, right? Because we're around our campfire, and we can do that. But I believe that at that moment that Jesus answers asks for the name, and answers that there is a sense of compassion, and it also that that spirit is then redeemed. Which tells us something else really, really important about this man, Jesus, who is also God, is that nothing is outside of his power of redemption and transformation. Because that's really what this story is about. It is a story of transformation. Because the next thing that then happens is the swine herds run off, they tell everybody in town, which I don't blame them. I mean, what what a thing to see, right? So we can have fun like imagining them telling, you won't believe what I just saw. This dude like comes up to the crazy wild dude and he says, what do you want? And they say, don't send us into the abyss. He's like, okay. And they jumped at our pigs and our pigs jumped off the cliff and 
oh man, what am I going to do now, right? And so they all run out there to see this crazy story, to check it out and see what's happening. And the scariest thing they could ever imagine is there. That this crazy man that everybody was so afraid of, that was so violent and erratic and unpredictable, he's clean. He's clean. He's washed. He's wearing clothes that cover him, that give him safety and protection. He's sitting there with Jesus, and this is my favorite line, He's in his right mind. You ever make a decision that you like were really worried about and you and you just you asked everybody for advice and you did a pro con list and you're just you're all shook up like your insides are just churning because of this decision and then you make that decision and that moment where you know it was the right thing. You were in your right mind because in that moment of decision You weren't thinking about the past and past decisions, and you weren't anticipating the future and wondering how the decision was going to play out. But you could just be there in that moment, in your right mind. That's peace. That's another way of being in our right mind, being focused, being present, simply being clean, washed anew, clothed, safe, present, that's peace. That's the peace of God that passes all understanding, and that's the peace that comes from the transformation of Jesus, and that is peace that comes from God alone. When we can stop thinking about the past and regretting the past, or being nostalgic for the past, when we can turn off our anxious brain so we're not worried about the future and what's coming around the corner and what's the bad news going to be next, but we can just be right here, sitting around our campfire, hearing these stories of Jesus, who was man, but also was God, who has the power of transformation. That is pure peace. And the wild thing is, we don't actually have to be possessed by evil spirits, although I think we can say that our minds can go really awful places sometimes. And we might do things that try to hold ourselves back, to make ourselves presentable, to let everybody think that we're all okay, and we're worthy of love. But the truth is, we all have those things in us. But it is loved. It is accepted. It is Jesus standing there with absolute compassion saying, what do you need? And all of us saying, don't send us into the abyss. That peace is there for us all. Being absolutely present in the moment as it is. And that is transformation. And I don't know about you, but I'm needing that a lot right now. I'm having a hard time reading the news every day. It just feels like it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And not in the good kind of around the campfire kinds of stories, right? Like scary, scary stuff is going on. But can I sit at the feet of Jesus? Being clean, made pure, in my right mind, clothed and safe, and remember that there was a man who was also God, who came to this earth to heal, to preach, to teach, and most importantly, to restore us to God. To die on a cross and be raised to new life again so that we have that hope. We have that redemption. We have that peace. So you may not have as crazy of a week as this man outside Gerasenes. <laughs> I hope there are no pigs jumping off cliffs in your future. But may you find peace. 
may you experience that sense of being made whole, of being safe in the presence of Jesus, and may your life be transformed. Amen. Our next hymn is We Are Called to Be God's People on page 390. We do celebrate Father's Day today, and we say Happy Father's Day, and we do have a prayer. Let us pray. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for fathers young and old. We pray for young fathers newly embracing their vocation. May they find courage and perseverance to balance work, family, and faith and joy and sacrifice. We pray, we pray for our own fathers around the world whose children are lost or suffering. May they take comfort in trusting that the God of compassion walks with them in their sorrow. We pray for men who are not fathers but still mentor and guide us with fatherly love and advice. We remember fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, uncles, all men in our lives who may no longer be with us but who live forever in our memory and nourish us with their love. Amen. And now, as I pray the prayers of the people, if you will respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. On this day that we do remember, fathers, let us offer our prayers to God, who has adopted us as sons and daughters through the waters of baptism. O oh God, you formed your son Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed your holy breath into his lungs, giving us all the gift of life. Breathe again your life into us, your children and your church, that we might be one with you. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, you formed great nations out of great families and blessed the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they might be a blessing to all. Bless our nation and all the nations of the world with your fatherly presence, wisdom, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the children of Israel found themselves slaves, making bricks for Pharaoh before you heard their cry and brought them to freedom. We pray for all in this world who are in trouble of any kind. We pray for the celebration of Juneteenth, honoring when America's slaves were freed. We pray for the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, the victims of war, and all who live in terror's wake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are injured, hurt, sick, lonely, or who live in fear. We especially pray for those who have been recently hospitalized. Roberta Farwell, Dr. Ted Young, Catherine Liner, and Carolyn Lynch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as our Heavenly Father, you gave us the gift of your own Son. And out of our human blindness, the crowds called for him to die on a cross. We do pray for the dying and the dead. We especially pray for the families of those who, Springmore residents who passed away this week. Ruth Smith. Mary Miller May, and Mr. Don Hansen. Father, we trust in your comfort of all those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father who dwells in heaven, we pray for all fathers. Strengthen and bless them to be faithful, loving, and present. And for those who, have, who you have brought into your kingdom ahead of their children and children ahead of their fathers, enfold them with your holy light and enfold us with your comfort, now and forever, we pray. And now let us pray the prayer that our Savior taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our last hymn this evening is I Love to Tell the Story, found on page 572.
May you remember as you leave this place that you are one in whom Christ delights and dwells. You live in the strong and unshakable kingdom of God. The kingdom is not in trouble, and neither are you. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this night and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.